Happy Hump Day. Welcome back to Looking Backwards, Looking Forwards. I'm C. Thomas Printer, and I'm here with Austerity Jones. Happy Wednesday, C. Thomas. Let's today talk about Russia saying, um, once again, a, a sabotage on the pipelines, gas pipelines. And Russia said that it was Ukraine trying to sabotage the lines. This was the uh, Turkish pipeline, am I correct? Yes, it's yeah. going through Turkey. Yeah, this is the one down there, right? So um, it's very interesting how we've seen explosions in Louisiana at the liquefying natural gas plant mm -hmm. that slowed down some of the shipments to Europe. And then we have the explosions over in the Balkans where all of a sudden that pipeline gets blown up, even though it wasn't really being used. But then that blew up, and now there's sabotage over here. This is um, this reminds me of the covert nature of both the Cold War, where everything was being done in the shadows and and things like that, and then it also reminds me a little bit of uh, the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor, right? Of like hmm. sneaking around, and this is what we're doing, and you know, like nobody will notice, and. Um, <sighs> I wonder what, you know, like, are we ever going to know who really did it? You know, like, I've heard some very credible people say that the United States blew up the pipeline. I've heard some people, um, you know, that have claimed that the British did it on behalf of the U.S., right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if we'll ever find out who actually did blow it up and, and whatnot, but um, it reminds me of that. And so the fact that they're doing it again uh, doesn't surprise me. Remember when we talked about it, we said, who has the most to gain? Ukraine? Right, yeah. that was one of ours. The U.S. Mm -hmm. was one of ours. Russia didn't make any sense. So even though no. America came out and said, "Yeah, Russia blew up the pipeline," like nobody believes that, you know. And then we <laughs> said maybe some environmental group. That was the other option we had. And so I don't know that we know, and you know, maybe we don't know about this one here. But you know, there was a, a bombing in Turkey, and so all of these things, you just wonder what's related. And you know, we're out here trying to grab little pieces of information and and put together a narrative and. Usually, sometimes we just don't know. Right. And um, other thing we have been talking on other episodes we have at our podcast, uh, the future of U.S. dollar. Ghana mm. plans mm -hmm. to buy oil with gold instead of dollars. Yes. How interesting, right? So... Which just brings us to what we just talked about. Ghana exactly. had an explosion three years ago at their only oil refinery, forcing them to import refined product, even though mm. they actually produce oil. They need the correct type of product, so they actually mm. import oil. But they have been faced with a strong dollar, which has caused them very... Um, hardship in terms of with dealing with their currency and so they are going to go off of buying oil with the dollar they're going to use something else and ghana happens to be africa's largest gold producer or one of them and they're going to buy oil with gold instead of the dollar now we've talked about this before when are these other countries going to say you know, the way to get rid of this pain and foreign currency exchange pain is to use something else, something that's tangible. That's exactly what the BRICS are talking about doing, but Ghana is going to do it first. So let's see and see if they are a good example and if they have success with this, if they can find trading partners. And if so, it will be very interesting to see if this picks up any steam. It's too soon to tell. Let's again talk about oil and gas because we cannot stop talking about them. <laughs> Norway looks like uh, is not going to let the companies to explore uh, in areas where it has not been searched before oil. And what do you think of that? Well, no, first of all, Norway has a good amount of natural gas, so they have that luxury. Um, I'm mm -hmm. quite certain that if the UK... Um, had some natural gas resources or potential resources, they would be looking quite seriously at those. So <laughs> Norway is uh, kind of uh, 
being a, a bit of a spoiled brat. Like, we have natural mm. gas. We're not going to go look over here because we're green. And they're the, the group, the internal political group, the SV, that, you know, the socialist left party, they're, they're committed to fighting climate change and they don't want to explore for new petroleum resources. And they're very committed to this and that's what they've kind of pushed through. And so they're going to not go and look for new sources of natural gas even though they could sell gas at such a high price to Europe right now, it would be very, very lucrative to do so. So say what you want. Okay. They're standing on their principles. Let's see how that works out for Norway. Right. And uh, what surprised me this week was the big news coming from China. Oh, uh, big news. Yes. Yes. I was, I was surprised to see the protests in China. Uh, obviously, they are protesting about the COVID measures. What do you think? Well, they've been escalating, right? They, they've had yes. some, you know, they've locked these people down now for a couple of years. And the Chinese people are a lot more patient than the Americans would have been or maybe the Europeans and, <laughs> and things Correct. like that. But they've kind of reached the end of their patience, right? Like, um, at Foxconn announced last week that, you know, they were literally walking, what did we say a couple of weeks ago, they were walking 25 miles home. Last week, they were police Correct. beating on some people pretty good, you know, in that area. And now you've got, you know, the over the weekend, you know, there's some tanks rolling through some spots and it kind of reminded people of 1989 and Tiananmen Square. This is getting serious. The one thing you have to remember is Xi is an autocrat at best and a dictator at worst those mm -hmm. usually aren't the guys that you want to try no. like you can you can say that and you know see what happens but it usually doesn't work out too well right and so you know if you know the, some of these people in the hong kong they just kind of disappeared we haven't heard from them again you know there's been some people that have been outspoken in china and they just kind of disappeared so it's a very politically charged issue uh, it's something that's gotten the international attention as well, right? Like there's been statements right. from the American and, you know, the uh, international community about, hey, you know, you've got to do away with this. And they, you know, are making a few little concessions here and there to try to, you know, bring about a little bit of peace. But you got to be real careful doing that in a situation such as um, a country like China, where they have more autocratic rule than most countries. Correct. Correct. Let's hope for the people for the best. Correct. And um, speaking of U.S., uh, let's come to U.S. Joe Biden there says that he's confident lawmakers can avert economically damaging U.S. rail strike. Yes. So this has been um, they've been kicking this down the road for a couple months now. And so there's a a group, uh, there's actually many different unions that touch different places of the um, American railway system, the freight handling mm -hmm. of the railway system. And I think they've gotten maybe about half of them to approve the, you know, the, the compromises and, and whatnot, but they haven't gotten all of them. And one of the big sticking points are like sick days and personal days, and they're not getting enough time off and they're wanting a pay raises because of inflation. And so there's a lot of different unions that are bargaining at the same time and they're looking to each other and making sure that everybody's in the same, pulling on the same end of the, the tug mm. of war rope there um, to try to get the best deal that they can. And so what, you know, the government has basically said is this is, you know, vital to our national interests and we will not put up with a strike. Well, um, if you prohibit them from doing so, that's probably the only thing worse than actually having a strike, right? Like you're going to have mm -hmm. slowdowns. You're going to have all of these different things that never, ever end well, right? It's just damaging and it's going to cause more problems and more problems and supply chain issues. And, uh, you know, you want to talk about bringing inflation back, just take mm -hmm. the railway system out where no one can get food. So anybody that has food can charge much, much higher prices. And all of a sudden this will trickle through the economy. It'll start as a trickle and it'll end up as a torrent in a matter of about a week. So they need oh, yeah, to get okay. together and they need to do the right thing here and make sure that, you know, 
they aren't held hostage either. That's the flip side of it. But we do need the rails. Um, the rails are way too important. They handle way too much cargo. I think I read a statistic that it was um, 467,000 trucks would be needed to replace the rails. And I don't know if that was for a week or whatever. But Whoa. it's so big. The numbers are so huge. We cannot have this breakdown. Oh, yes, yes. The supply chain is already super, super fragile. Still As Jim recovering. Record says, the supply chain is the economy. Correct, correct. An economy, recession, yield curve, inversion, reaching a new extreme, interesting extreme. What's your take on this? We've been seeing the inverted yield curves um, keep inverting and keep inverting. And so it was a few months ago when the twos and tens, which is the two year and the 10 year uh, U.S. Treasuries, when they inverted, meaning the two year yield went higher um, than the 10-year yield was offering, uh, that's never a good sign. That is a very strong recession indicator. However, we have recently seen the three-month 10-year also invert. That has a 100% recession indicator. I forget, going back 100 years. Now, that's not the end of it. That's if it inverts and stays inverted just for a very short amount of time. We have now went 60, I haven't checked it today, 60, 70 points inverted. Like this is the biggest inversion since 1981, right? That was when Paul Vol Volcker raised interest rates to a crazy amount, you know, and broke. Mm -hmm. And we had two recessions. Well, that was the, the first of the recessions. It was a really bad one, the, the worst one since um, the Great Depression. And so this is what's flashing red lights at us, right? You're hearing these pundits come out and they're saying the Fed needs to stop. They're going to break the economy. Have you not li been listening to the Fed for the last six months? They're telling you they're going to break the economy. These people need to get the shit out of their ears. They're not listening. The Fed is going to break the economy. They've been saying this is how we're going to get rid of inflation. And no one seems to be listening. The bond prices are going down. The bonds market saying that the, the, something's breaking. That's right. He's telling you every time Powell speaks, he's going to break something. That's exactly what he's doing. And the yield curve is telling us that. Right. Thank you very much, C. Thomas. You're for welcome. All, all, for all your comments. And as usual, we would like to thank to our listeners. And if you like to read more those news, you can go to our blog at cthomasprinter.com. Talk to you next week, C. Thomas. I will talk to you next week. Austerity, and until then, remember this quote from Margaret Thatcher. One's life must matter. <laughs>